Good morning. And um, Alex, uh, father of the uh, conference, I'll, uh, I will know when austerity is, uh, is over, when uh, housing benefit actually pays for housing and uh, social housing start to be built again, um, then we'll know it's over. I'm not seeing it quite yet. Um, before I start, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here. Um, I have slight um, degree of trepidation, um, not because of the uh, ferocious audience, although that is, uh, is part of it, but that uh, the first time I spoke at one of these conferences, um, I fell off the stage and I still bear the scar. Um, <laughs> And so uh, my expectations aren't too high. I just want to get off the stage safely um, at the end of what I have to uh, say. Um, also, before I start, actually, um, what was really interesting about that in a, a room full of uh, medical professionals was when the um, venue health and safety person, or first aider, came running up saying, get off him, you can't touch his hand, I'm the qualified first aider, <laughs> uh, as I was being put back together again by uh, eminent uh, doctors. So. Uh, um, so first, can I just say thank you for the amazing work that the faculty does uh, to prevent, tackle and solve homelessness for many, many people. I would say this is probably the biggest gathering um, that we ever get of hugely talented people committed to ending homelessness, um, possibly with the exception of the annual crisis staff conference, but uh, um, this, is, this is maybe a close, uh, close second. You just have an incredible... Um, talent, skill, knowledge in your profession and what you do anyway, for you then to add to that by integrating your work um, with the task of preventing and ending homelessness. It's something I just really like to pay tribute to, so thank you so much. Um, the goal of the organisation that I have the privilege to lead um, is as simple as, together we will end homelessness. We don't think homelessness is inevitable. Um, we think we know some of the solutions and we know that we can end it if we work together. Some people outside of the sector might think that's a bit naive and a bit of an unachievable aim, but for those of us, like the people in this room who work every single day to tackle homelessness, we know what causes it and we know what can end it. So it's pretty disgraceful that right now there are more than 170,000 families and individuals across Great Britain who are experiencing the worst forms of homelessness, whether that's people sleeping rough, whether that's people living in unsuitable temporary accommodation, hostels, tents, their cars, public transport. And that includes over 20,000 uh, households who are stuck in unsuitable temporary accommodation, like B&Bs, nightly paid hostels, and so on. And that number has doubled between 2012 and 2017. Um, and I say across Great Britain, that's mostly driven by increases in England. Um, although you look north to Scotland and find that although the numbers in unsuitable temporary accommodation have stayed pretty static, the length of time people are in that situation has been growing, so it's not perfect anywhere. And while rough sleeping is probably the most visible form of homelessness, and every single one of us walking here this morning will have seen people who are likely to be rough sleeping, um, we know that for every single person on our streets, there's another 12 um, who are stuck in situations like sofa surfing or living in temporary accommodation. And uh, our research also shows that uh, without significant government intervention, these figures will all grow substantially. So when um, a couple of years ago, crisis or 20, 2017 crisis passed its 50th anniversary, we were pretty ashamed by that um, as well. We were a temporary project. We were a temporary project set up to solve a temporary problem in 1967. So to reflect our, our dismay and our determination, we celebrated our 50th anniversary by publishing the document, Everybody In, How to End Homelessness in Great Britain, with more than 1,000 experts helping us to write this, academics and lawyers giving us a real understanding of the structures of homelessness, people who work at the front line giving us expert insight into the barriers to support that, to support that so many people face, and most importantly, um, many, many people with their own lived experience of homelessness bringing practical solutions and first-hand knowledge of what works and what doesn't work. So it out, the, this plan that, that we then produced outlines the evidence-based solutions that if we had the leadership, the policies, and the investment could, if we had those things, 
end homelessness in a matter of years. For me, what it is, it's like it's the manual. So uh, just imagine if the Prime Minister woke up tomorrow morning and uh, made ending homelessness a real priority. Um, we could give her the manual of what to do next. This isn't some mystery that we don't know how to solve. We've got the manual, we need the political leadership and the investment. And we're gonna hear some of the things, I'm sure, from Bill that the government are doing um, to certainly tackle rough sleeping. And um, you know, we talk about ending homelessness and people look at me like that's some kind of weird, idealistic nirvana that we're talking about. But uh, we're talking about five things. And I don't think there's a person in this room or frankly in this country who doesn't wanna live in a society where the following five things are true, where nobody sleeps rough, where no one is forced to live in transient or dangerous accommodation, where no one lives in emergency accommodation without a plan to move on into settled housing very quickly, where everybody who's at risk of homelessness gets the help they need to prevent it from happening, and where no one becomes homeless because they leave a state institution, such as the care system, a prison, a hospital, or another healthcare setting. And of course, that's the bit that you really know about. That's the bit where the expertise is in this, uh, in this room. And, you know, we all know the links between health and homelessness in this room. We're going to hear more about this in a, in, in a minute. But Homeless Links Health Needs Audit found that 73% of homeless people reported physical health problems. 41% said that was a long-term problem. 45% had been diagnosed with a mental health issue. And 80% reported some form of mental health issue. And, of course, the uh, um, large-scale review published in The Lancet found that uh, people living with severe social exclusion, homelessness, and adverse childhood events face mortality risks that are eight to 12 times higher than people who are housed. So the plan that we published includes some recommendations about healthcare. And uh, you know, as well as the massive impact that this has on people's lives, we think it probably saves the NHS money if we get this right. Certainly the uh, the number of A&E visits and, and hospital admissions made by homeless people we think are four times more than the general public. And there's very, very strong evidence that not only are homeless people using health services more, um, there's strong evidence that use of the health system rises in advance of becoming homeless and peaks. Certainly the, uh, the research in Scotland showed that uh, use of the, uh, the health system peaked about three weeks before making a homelessness application. So we all know, we all know those, those links. Um, and, you know, the government's not doing nothing. So the Westminster government already invests £1.1 billion in homelessness services. But I have to say most of that is spent once the person has reached that, uh, that crisis point. And uh, when we did research to establish for our plan what the current and projected levels of homelessness were, we also modelled what would happen if we implemented certain policy changes. And one of those is all about prevention. If we took the very best practice of local authorities at the moment on prevention of homelessness and extended that across the country, by 2021 we see a 22% decrease in homelessness. By 2026 we see a 27% decrease in homelessness just through some very simple prevention activities in the housing office, in the local authority. Um, so what does all this mean in terms of policy and practice change. Well, you know as well as I do that the point when someone is released from hospital is a really key moment, a really key moment where a successful intervention could be made that prevents them not just becoming homeless that day, but prevents them from becoming homeless generally. And there's great evidence from the pathway teams of how to do that in practice in the hospital. But it's not everywhere. Nine out of 140 NHS trusts, I think, was the, uh, the last count. Um, Alex talked about the Homelessness Reduction Act. And, of course, that was a, a massive welcome shift towards a much sharper um, focus on prevention activities. You know, new, new duties to prevent and relieve homelessness for thousands of people um, who simply would have received no or little assistance under the old legislation. So it's certainly something to, uh, to celebrate it introduced a new duty on specified public authorities to refer people to a housing authority 
if they're homeless or likely to become homeless in the next 56 days. And some of those public authorities that have that duty are prisons, probation services, job centres, social services authorities, and hospitals and emergency departments, and those duties came into force on the 1st of October 2018. And, you know, it's an important step, but what we're seeing is that some public authorities are able to discharge their duty by putting in place some pretty narrow um, referral processes. And not only that, but of course, it's there for some parts of the system, but it's not there for other parts of the system. So while hospitals and A&E departments are covered by the duty, um, GPs aren't. And that's a massive missed opportunity, we think, in the legislation. That's why in Scotland, they're, consult or they're about to start consulting on a much more comprehensive uh, prevention duty, which would cover not just public authorities, but organisations that contract with those public authorities as well. But, so let's hope that uh, that goes through. You know, and the legislation is a good thing, but when we were campaigning for it, we were advocating for a much stronger duty uh, requiring all public authorities to work together with local housing authorities to prevent homelessness themselves, not just to find narrow referral paths. Um, and there is, you know, there is a lot going on which we should be proud of in this country, which is about preventing homelessness. Um, welfare system, access to affordable social rented housing, free healthcare through the NHS, all these things are quite um, wonderful rights that we have in this country, but we're not really making them work on ending homelessness, or there wouldn't be 170,000 people um, currently homeless. So I just wanted to work, uh, talk a little bit about your, your work, and you know, the work of this faculty, the work of Pathway in preventing and relieving homelessness for patients, improving their health and well-being, reducing delays in discharging patients is just quite remarkable. Um, the inclusion of both clinical and housing staff in that team, providing support for homeless patients, is absolutely common sense, but is also absolutely key to its success. Um, but it's not enough. So in our plan, we, 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 we make some recommendations for the health system. First of all, every hospital that sees more than 200 homeless patients each year should have a full pathway team, including a GP, including nursing staff, care navigators, dedicated housing workers. And as I said, currently only nine out of 140 have that in place in England at the moment. Secondly, all frontline health professionals with, should have comprehensive training to help them identify when patients are at risk of homelessness. We do great things when we've identified that, but training to help them identify that and understand um, what should happen next. And thirdly, uh, you know, data, requiring NHS Digital to develop a standardised way of recording housing access, housing status across all health data sets. <coughs> You know, I just think with the, uh, uh, the technology we have, why is that just not simple? Um, the other intervention I want to talk to, uh, talk to you about is, is critical time interventions. Mo many people in this room, most people in this room, will either be aware of it from the research or aware of it from their own practice, but it's a model which has been um, successfully and widely adopted in the US and various European contexts and has proven to be effective at preventing homelessness for people leaving state institutions like hospitals and other healthcare settings. Um, I have to say that's a fancy name, critical time intervention, for making sure that someone who is vulnerable um, has a housing-led approach, gets access to permanent accommodation, and gets the support they need at the right time, in the right order, and in a time-limited way, um, which I have to say is, is like applied common sense. In Denmark, the success rate for people maintaining their housing with a critical time intervention like that is 95%. Um, and there's all sorts of research to show that that's, uh, that's the right way to go. PwC did some modeling for crisis and found that currently um, 1,211 households in England leave each year leaving a state institution and who would benefit um, from a CTI. So there are still people who are not getting um, that applied common sense of critical time interventions and I think there's an opportunity for Pathway and for the faculty to really produce and provide the evidence to make that such a compelling thing to do. Um, final thing I want to touch on is the, and I know we're going to hear more about this in a minute, is the sharp end 
of what happens when we get this wrong. Most of you will have seen the Office of National Statistics figures that were released at the end of last year, which showed that almost 600 people died while homeless in England and Wales in 2017. You may also have seen the Bureau of Investigative Journalism figures re released on Monday evening this week, showing um, at least 798 people had died while homeless since the 1st of October 2017. And far worse than that, that the, the new research from UCL showing that of 600 cases that they studied, a third of those deaths were treatable conditions that uh, could have been improved with the right medical care. Treatable illnesses, TB, pneumonia, gastric ulcers. Um, many of the other deaths were caused by things like suicide and homicide, um, but that fact, that fact of a third of those deaths being treatable and probably would have been treated if those people hadn't been homeless, I think is devastating, outrageous, cheesy words. It's just terrible. So, and it actually, the work that you do keeps those numbers as small as they are, but I think between us, we've got to make sure that we stop those tragedies once and for all. And for me, that's about tackling the root causes of homelessness by ensuring people have access to safe and truly affordable housing and making sure there's a robust welfare safety net in place those two things that are the tests for me of when austerity has actually ended, a housing benefit system that actually pays for housing and starting to see some building of social houses. It's an awful fact that there were more, there were more social houses built in Scotland last year than there were in England. England is 10 times the size of Scotland. I mean, just ridiculous. So, um, rant over. Um, what I would say, just before, I ha just before we, we hear from, from Bill, is that you know, the government's rough sleeping plan is showing some signs of working. I think it's really important to say that, that uh, they took a clear decision to make sure that in tackling the emergency of rough sleeping, they would invest in key places, in outreach workers, outreach teams, exactly the right thing to do. And whether or not we believe the annual rough sleeping figures that come out. What I do believe is the differential between um, the claimed 2% reduction overall and the 19% reduction in the places where the government had invested in more outreach teams. I believe that differential. I don't necessarily believe the overall numbers, um, but that shows that those interventions do work. I would say if it works so well, do it everywhere do it forever, and that will tackle a massive part of the emergency of people who are on the street. But I'd also say, when the bath's overflowing, you turn the tap off first, you don't reach for the mop first. And at the moment, we're doing a good job of mopping up on homelessness. So, uh, you know, there's lots in there, there's lots of evidence. I, I, I'm absolutely in awe of the work that uh, people in this faculty do, day in, day out, with their amazing medical and health skills to tackle and deal with um, homelessness crisis. We're very, very keen to continue to work with you um, to bring about the changes that are needed. Thank you so much for the work you do, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>